respected dignitaries of the dais, my dear friends and colleagues. This time the topic is on biomechanics of the hip. I will be very basic because uh, for a postgraduate to answer what is there for biomechanics of the hip should be, it should be very basic. So this presentation will be very basic. We have already heard the presentation on biomechanics of the knee and we all know that uh, there is not much congruency in the knee but the knee is very stable because the mechanism of stability in the knee and the hip cannot be compared. In the hip it is a self-closed mechanism because the round head articulates with the deep acetabulum and that gives stability. So it is a, a ball and socket joint and the stability offered in the knee is different and the hip is different. So this is very important to remember like that. And so it is a proximal most part of the hip and these are the joints through which the whole body weight goes to the floor. And we should remember that these two axes are very important. And any of the postgraduate who is not well versed with this is going to have problems in his examination as well as in his practice. So the mechanical axis passes from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle joint and the anatomical axis from the center of the knee to the tip of the trochanter. And this too makes an angle of around 7 degrees. If you don't keep this angle, the biomechanics of the hip as well as the lower limb is going to be abnormal. So these are the two lines we should remember before we start learning about biomechanics of the hip. Hip is a first order liver. First order liver means the fulcrum is in the center and the weight act on either sides. It is just like a simple balance. So it is known as a first order liver. While standing, it's a common sense to remember that half of the body weight acts through he each hip joint. But in the swing phase, it is around four times the body weight which acts through one hip joint. For example, if you stand on one limb, the weight acting through that hip is around four times. And if the fulcrum does not act, and if the socket and the muscles are not good, the hip is not going to be stable. But at the same time, if the force is transmitted in a different direction, then it will not be a stable hip. The muscles are very important and it is not very easy to study about the muscles. Study is complex, but muscles are very important. If the muscles are not acting, then the biomechanics is not going to be right. And the forces which act through the hip joint are not only the body weight, it is the ground reaction force and the pull of the abductors. That is why around four times weight acts through a single stance hip gate. So the hip is designed to support the body weight. It is designed for range of motion and it is designed for bearing the weight more than many times the body weight. And this force on the hip is going to be more in the ascending part of the gate, ascending stairs like that. So in this simple diagram, I will describe it just like this. So when you stand on one limb, the opposite side of the pelvis is going to droop down. But it does not happen usually because abductors are there. Abductors pull and keep the pelvis stable. So the force acting through the hip joint is not only the body weight, but the force produced by the pull of the abductors. So it is going to be more than the body weight. In a single, in a stand space uh, where you stand on both limbs, it is the total body weight and the center of gravity acting through the middle of the body divided in between the two hips which acts through the hip joint. So this is the normal biomechanics, center of the center of gravity divided equally between the two sides. So that is about the stand space the body weight acts and half of the body weight acting through each hip joint. If you take one hip joint, the body weight acts through the center, the abductors pull on the other side and the total weight acts at the center of the hip joint. Now what happens when one leg is off the ground? When one leg is off the ground, the center of gravity is in the center Naturally what happens is this part of the pelvis droops down, but the body tries it in such a way that it does not happen. First, the center of gravity is tilted to the limb on which the patient is standing, but that is not enough. Then the abductors has to contract and that will make the hip stable or that will make the foot off the ground on the opposite side. 
So you have two forces here, one the body weight, the other the pull of the abductors. So it has got a resultant and the resultant acts through the central deep joint. So it is going to be the summation of the body weight as well as the pull of the abductors. Now what happens, the lever arm on the lateral side is short. So the abductors has to work with hard and more force to keep the pelvis or the foot off the ground. And that's why I told the lever arm on the lateral side is shorter. So it is around 3 is to 1. And so the force with which the abductors has to act is very much. Now when you use a cane, what happens? When you use a cane, you can push the center of gravity instead of pushing to the limb on which the patient stands. It can be pushed to, to, to the opposite side. So this is a usual situation where cane is not used. And when the cane is used, the center of gravity is pushed to the opposite side. Now what happens? The abductus has to contract only with less power. So the resultant is going to be very low. So the amount of force acting through the hip on which the patient stands is going to be very low when you use a cane. If you use around 15% of your force across the cane, you can reduce the force transmitted through the hip on which you stand by 50%. If you use 15% body weight or 15% of the force through the upper limb, the force acting through the hip can be reduced by around 50%. And uh, this is also very important to remember. If the center of gravity or the line of weight transmission is posterior to the hip and anterior to the knee, that body or that patient is going to be a stable situation. But if you have the situation where the weight transmission is anterior, the patient will fall backwards. If you have the weight transmission posterior, the patient is going to fall forwards. So in this situation, the line of weight transmission also is going to be very important. Otherwise, the patient has to fall down. Now look at the heel strike. In heel strike, the pelvis has to rotate forwards. For that, the line of transmission has to be on the front and then here it is posterior. In the mid stance, the line of weight transmission should be on the posterior side because here the pelvis rotates back. So this sort of a biomechanical situation has to happen for a normal gait cycle to happen. Now what happens here is, when one limb, one limb standing, the abductors contracts and this pelvis is elevated. That is the only situation where you can walk. But in a situation where the abductors fail to act, you are going to have a drooping down of the pelvis. Also when there is a dislocation, what happens? The abductors cannot contract. Again, the situation pelvis falls down. That gait is not going to be normal. The same situation happens in fracture neck of femur. So the fulcrum as well as the liver should be normal. And while walking, first this part of the pelvis has to go up and then it has to rotate forwards and flex forwards. This situation happens only when the muscles are normal. So first the pelvis should be off the ground on the opposite side, then it has to rotate and flex. So these things should happen for a normal gait to happen. Now in coxa volga what happens? The lateral liver is very much reduced. In coxa vera what happens? The lateral liver is very much increased. Both situations are not good for the biomechanics of the hip joint. In a coxa valga, the lateral liver is very much reduced. When the lateral liver is very much reduced, the force with which the abductors has to contract to, the, to keep the pelvis stable is going to be tremendous. So for example, if the, in coxa valga, around, uh, if the liver is reduced around 1 seventh, then 7 times the body weight is going to act through the hip joint. In coxa vera, the lateral liver is increased. Then what happens? The abductus becomes inefficient. It cannot stabilize the pelvis because the muscle is stretched beyond its physiological limits because of the coxa vera and long lateral liver. So here the abductus fails to act. In the other situation, abductus has to contract with more force. Both are not good for normal biomechanics of the hip. So this is coxa vera. The lateral liver is very much increased and so the abductus becomes inefficient. And here what happens is, when there is coxa vera, there is more of shearing force acting through the hip joint, which is also not good for your hip or for your replaced hip. Now this happens when you have a coxa vera. You have a situation here where 
there is an increased neck shaft angle here where there is a reduced neck shaft here. So these things are not good for a normal physiological situation. Now what happens in arthroplasty? When you do arthroplasty, you have to match all these things. Then only you are going to have a good situation. Now you have to have a correct inclination, correct limb length, correct antiversion and correct neck shaft angle. Otherwise your replaced hip is not going to survive. Now look at this situation. Here you have produced a long limb. When the limb is long, the force acting through the hip is going to be tremendous. So you should not do that. When you have a more inclination, this is going to happen. It is going to dislocate. Now it's very difficult to assess the antiversion in your x-rays. You can take a, take a shoot through view, you can go for a CT scan, but that is also one situation where your hip is going to fail. Now look at this situation. If you draw a line along the tip of the trochanter, it has to cross the center of the hip. Now here it does not happen. Here it is far above. You can see that the center is far below the tip of trochanter. Here it is far above. These things are not good for good biomechanics. Again you see the neck shaft angle here or the coxa vira happening to the stem. Eventually that hip fails. First it fails by loosening and then it fractures. So these are the situations your replaced hip is going to fail. Now in neck of femur again, neck of femur fracture again, this problem can be applied. If you have a valgus impacted angle, that fracture will definitely unite. But that hip is going to fail because the force acting through the hip is tremendous and that head will undergo a vascular necrosis. Now what happens when the fracture angle is more, Powell's angle is more, type 3 Powell's angle, that fracture will not unite because there is a lot of shearing stress occurring through here fracture side. So these are the situations where you can reduce the fracture angle by a abduction osteotomy. So the current concept is to adjust your abductor liver only relative to the offset of the trochanter. So you should always remember your offset while you replace your hip or you fix your fracture neck of femur. And the biological nature should be to preserve the normal biomechanics as far as possible in your arthroplasty or your fracture fixation. So if you keep your biomechanics right, then everything is going to be right. If you keep your biomechanics wrong, then everything is going to be bad. Thank you for patient listening.